Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomakang. We have been enjoying our time in the study of the book of Ephesians. Have we not? Can I get an amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. Our family has been amazing. We always learn something every time we open our Bible. And we hope that your life has been blessed and enhanced through the study of the book of Ephesians. Today, we begin a topic entitled The Call to Stand. And each one of us will be dealing with this. And it seems like we have a lot in common on this lesson today. And uh, each one of us has prayed for the Lord to give us guidance and wisdom. But before we start anything, I want to just introduce our panel. I think you know most of them if you are part of our 3ABN family. But to my immediate left, Jill Morricone, Vice President of 3ABN. Good to have you here, Jill. Thank you, Pastor John. Good to be here. I have Monday, Finding Strength in Christ. Okay, and Daniel Perrin, we call him Professor. He's been a teacher, a wonderful student of Scripture. Good to have you here, Daniel. I'm just a learner. Okay. And I have Tuesday's lesson, The Great Controversy in Paul's Letters. Wow, what a good study. Pastor John Dinsey, what do you have for us today? I have Wednesday, and it's called Standing on the Ancient Battlefield. Okay, and at the other bookend is another, another James under. Rafferty, James and John. Good to have you here, James. What's your approach today? Good to be here, John. I have Thursday's lesson, Wrestling Against Evil Powers. Wow, wow. It's going to be an exciting study, so just stay tuned. If you have your Sabbath school lesson, you can follow along, but all you need is just an attentive mind and a prayerful heart and your Bible. But Jill, would you have our prayer for us this sure. morning? Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful for the gift of your word and your spirit. And as we open the Bible, as we open these holy pages, especially studying Ephesians chapter 6, we ask for the infilling and impartation of your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear and a heart to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, I like the title that uh, Dr. John McVeigh gives to Lesson 12, at least for uh, the portion, he calls it battle speech, <laughs> battle speech. And when I approached that, I thought to myself, wow, you know, when you face difficult times, you better have some battle speech. Mm -hmm. And that battle speech is, I believe, uh, a way of encouraging yourself. You're about to go into battle. And when you follow the scriptures, there were many cadences that existed in the life of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would sing before they went into battle. Sometimes they would pray before they went into battle. Sometimes they call for a spiritual reform before they went into battle. But if they didn't do any of those three, they faced a defeat. When they faced the battle of Ai, they thought, what a small, insignificant nation. We don't need to have to consult the Lord. We could handle this on our own. And you know, the story is amazing how they've faced an amazing defeat. But we begin in Ephesians chapter six and um, as I alluded to just a moment ago, each one of us is going to be dealing with these from a different perspective. And uh, let's start with verse 10, and I'll read down to verse 20. And then we'll pull out some of the very important points that I believe are connected to battle speech. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren. You can always tell Paul the Apostle uses that phrase a lot, finally. Mm. And it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And then look what he says that we must do. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 
What a call, a caution. Now, if this was true in the days of Paul to the church of Ephesus, how true is it to us today mm -hmm. that we must put on the whole armor of God? I'm sure that Paul didn't have internet in his day, didn't have the digital invasion that we have in our day, did not have the massive cities that are laced with crime of every description. He did not have the pressures of society that are not leaking in our homes, but pouring into our homes. And so if in that docile society, Paul spoke to the Ephesians to put on the whole armor. How much more is it necessary for us today? When we talk about battle speech, I like one of the questions that Paul asks. He says, what should Paul's warning that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against supernatural enemies teach us about where our only hope of victory is? Now, I've outlined some passages here that I believe are closely connected to battle speech. One of the first ones is the journey of the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And not too long after they came out, Pharaoh decided, I'm going to pursue them. He chose the choices of his chariots and he went after them. And they heard the thundering hooves of the horses and they heard the, the, the thundering wheels of the chariots pursuing them. And the Bible says in Exodus 14, they lifted up their eyes and they saw the Egyptians coming after them and they were very afraid. And then they complained, they complained to Moses. Now, as a pastor, sometimes that happens. Members are facing difficulty and challenges in their lives and they say, Pastor, what do I do? And I always tell them, bring it to the Lord in prayer. And I love the way that Moses handled the situation and the Lord gave him a message to give to the children of Israel. Look at Exodus chapter 14 and I love this. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. In verse 15, Jill. 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. <laughs> I love that. I had a whole sermon entitled, Go Forward. When you go forward, you'll notice that in the, in the trajectory of their journey from Egypt to Canaan, you can't progress if you go backward. Any steps backward would be a closer, uh, a narrowing the distance between your pursuer and those who want to enslave you again. And so the Lord said to them, go forward. Even when they face the Jordan, go forward. The forward motion of the Christian, the forward motion of the Christian is an indication that whether our steps are large or small, we trust the Lord. Go forward. Amen. And so when you're facing difficulty in your walk with Christ, when you face difficulty in your marriage, in your home, in your finances, don't forget this verse, verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. That's right. Sometimes we fight for ourselves. And I like what he says, and you shall hold your peace. How challenging is it to hold your peace in times of difficulty? You want to do anything but that. You want to yell or scream or shout and ask, what do we do? How do we con control ourselves in this seemingly helpless circumstance? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 29 to 33. Another example of the Lord fighting for the children of Israel. And then, Jill, I didn't number them, but we'll go through my short list Yay. and bring out these points before we transition to you. Deuteronomy 1, verses 29 to 33. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Sometimes you have to remember what the Lord did. Sometimes you said, I remember this happened to me before. And the Lord said, did you remember what I did for you? If you could see it in your eye of faith, there's no reason to be terrified. He says in verse 31, and in the wilderness, when you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man, I love the picture, as a man carries his son. And all the way that you went until you came to this place, in verse 32. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. When they faced difficulty, the Lord cooled the circumstances down during the day. And when the night became cold and foreboding, he warmed it up with the pillar of fire by night. But what was the encouragement to Joshua? Look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. He says, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you he will not leave you nor forsake you. How many times have we said that the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you? 
that's a constant reminder that the Lord who did not forsake the children of Israel, battle speech, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Amen. We have Joshua 1 and verse 9, another, another approach to battle speech. Look at that together. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. So whether you travel just locally, whether you travel around the world, if you are on God's mission, as once I was coming back from South Florida, getting ready to go to the Philippines, and I was on a very, very turbulent Southwest Airlines flight, and the lady next to me was crying, crying her heart out, and I was listening to a song as I was getting ready to join the Heritage Singers in the Philippines. And I said to the lady, ma'am, ma'am, could you listen to this? And it, the song was, I Know the Peace Speaker. Amen. And the Lord so happened to synchronize it that she said, who are you? I, I, I'm John Lonke. I'm a pastor. I, I want to encourage you. Listen to this. And she listened to it until the plane landed. Mm -hmm. And then she said to me, she says, um, thank you for allowing me to travel with you. Mm -hmm. I said, ma'am, everything is going to be okay. I'm on the Lord's mission. I'm going to be in the Philippines in two days. It's going to be just fine. And sometimes you've got to look back at your history with God and know that circumstances that are there to challenge your faith are not there to defeat God's plan. 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, there's another one. The Lord told Samuel, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you, and he will give you into our hands. That's the declaration Samuel made. We're not going to fight you with swords and shields. God's going to win the battle. We cannot wrestle against flesh and blood that we cannot see. We cannot wrestle against the powers which are stronger than us. We cannot defeat a power that has more experience than us, which the devil does. But we can trust the Lord who has defeated every enemy. So here's, here's quickly now. Nothing is impossible for God. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. no. Second one, Romans 8, verse 37. In all situations, we can be victorious. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Third one, in all confrontations, nothing can place a wedge between us and God. Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the other one, nothing can cancel God's blessings. Romans 8, verse 28. For we know that how many things? Oh. All things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. And then we have in Revelation 15, verse 2. James, here's your book, Revelation 15, 2. The end result is prognosticated. We will be victorious. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. The victory is prognosticated. We will win in the strength of the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John. What a great introduction. You're on fire today. I Amen. love that. Thank you. My name is Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at finding strength in Christ. Now, as Pastor John referenced, we all have the same passage, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, but all looking at it from a different perspective. There's four metaphors for the church that we find in the book of Ephesians. We've studied in chapter 2, the living temple. We studied the body of Christ in chapter 4. We studied the bride of Christ in chapter 5. And now we get to the army of Christ in chapter 6. I love that battle speech that you did. That was powerful. As we look at finding strength in Christ, I want to start with Ephesians 6, verse 10. Pastor John read it, but we're going to read it again. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in yourself. No. Is that what it says? <laughs> be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The battle begins with the Lord. The battle continues with the Lord and it ends with the Lord. The battle does not take place. We might try to do it in our own strength but we're not victorious. We can never win without the Lord. That's right. How do we approach conflict? How do we approach problems? How do we approach battles in our own strength or in the Lord? 
What I want to do, the lesson focuses on finding that strength in Christ for the battles and the conflicts that we face. What I want to do is flip it backwards, you could say, and we're going to talk about five hindrances that we have to let Christ fight our battle. Okay. So many times we're our worst enemy. We get in the way of allowing him to fight the battle for us. So let's look at those five hindrances. Hindrance number one is my pride. Seeking to handle the battle on my own. Hmm. Have you ever done that? I think all sin, all sin stems from pride and selfishness. Mm -hmm. We see this in the beginning with Lucifer. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. And we see his pride at the very beginning. We're in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. And you know what's interesting to me? Because we teach self-sufficiency to children from a very young age, do we not? Yay, look at you, you can tie your own shoes. You can <laughs> dress yourself. You can feed yourself. And as we go throughout life, we teach, we applaud self-sufficiency. I got this. I can handle this problem on my own. I can handle this battle. I don't need anybody else. And it's almost to the point of a fault. We see Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. What did he say in his heart? The five eyes of pride. I will ascend into heaven. I'm going to occupy heaven. That is position. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will exercise authority. He wanted to rule. That's the R in pride. Yeah. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. In other words, all will be in subjection to me. That's a form of idolatry, the I in pride. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He wanted to possess God's glory. I call that the D of pride, the dazzling. He wanted to dazzle and possess God's glory. Finally, I will be like the Most High. I will be as God. This is the E of pride, equality. He wanted to be like God or equal to God. So the first hindrance to letting Christ fight our battles is my own pride. And what is the solution? Depend on Jesus. Look to Jesus, not yourself. John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Recognize that we can't do anything without the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the second hindrance to letting Christ fight our battles? It's my own intellect and wisdom. Now this goes along with pride for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's seeking to use my intellect or my intelligence to give direction or to outsmart others. Have you ever thought, I'm smart enough to take this on. I know the right direction to go. I don't even need to ask God for wisdom because I know the direction. I, I got this, God. I, I have the situation. Or I know what the Word of God says. I don't even need to pray and ask for understanding before I read the Word because I got this. I've read the Word before. Hmm. You know, Adam and Eve in the beginning, when the temptation and the serpent said, you shall be like God, they thought, oh, wow, I want that intellect and I want that wisdom and I want to be like him. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, that says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Don't let the mighty man glory in his might. Don't say, oh, I got this. I got a good, keen mind. I got this. No, let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Right. So what's the solution? Ask God for wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5. If you lack wisdom, go before God and ask Him who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it will be given Him. Amen. The third hindrance to letting Christ fight our battles is our money. Now, this isn't to say that money is a bad thing. We know it's not. God gives money to be given to others or to support the work of God, to care for our needs. But when we seek to use money to buy solutions or buy comfort, that's a problem. Okay. You think of Simon in Acts chapter 8. What did he try to buy? The Holy Spirit. I think, of, I think sometimes this might be more a female gender issue than a male gender. 
If a woman's having a hard day, what does she say? I'm going to go buy some clothes. <laughs> That's using money to buy comfort, right? Or I'm going to go out and buy some ice cream. Money can't buy salvation. Money can't buy time. Money can't buy happiness. Money cannot buy integrity or character. The solution is to accept the free gift. We can't buy salvation. Accept the free gift of salvation. I love Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Ho, everyone who thirsts, are you thirsty? Come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and wages for that which does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. You see, Jesus' death paid for this feast. Yet we try to earn it. We try to earn mm. salvation. When we enter into conflict and struggle, we think, oh, we can buy our way out of this. No, go to God. Hindrance number four to letting Christ fight our battles is my emotions. Hmm. This is seeking to base my Christian experience on how I feel. If I feel forgiven today, I must be forgiven. If I pray and I feel like my prayer goes up to heaven, then it must have reached heaven. Hmm. If I don't feel saved, then I must not be saved. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. And why is that? That's because our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Mm. Our heart is not trustworthy. Okay. Proverbs 28, verse 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Okay. What is the solution? Accept what the Word of God says about you by faith. Okay. First John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he will forgive he will cleanse. John 3, 16, God loves you and gave his only begotten son for you. Right. Ephesians chapter one, you are redeemed. First Peter with the precious blood of Christ. Romans 5, 1, we are justified by faith and we have peace with God. Right. Second Corinthians 12, 9, God's grace is sufficient in your time of weakness. 1 John 4, 18, you don't have to walk in fear because there is no fear in love. Mm -hmm. Finally, hindrance number five to um, letting Christ fight our battles is my work ethic. Now, it's a good thing to work hard, but this is the sense of seeking to somehow work harder to merit favor with God. All false religion is based in works, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism, mm -hmm. Catholicism, even Protestants who say, I'm saved by grace through faith and now I better grit my teeth and work harder to become sanctified. No, mm -hmm. grace gives us, we are saved by grace through faith. Justification, that's the word I was looking for. Justification is by grace through faith, but sanctification is God working in us as well. The solution? is to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand that justification and sanctification, Him transforming my character into the character of Christ is through Jesus. So those hindrances to letting Christ fight for us, pride, intellect, and wisdom, my money, my emotions, and my own works, look to Jesus instead. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Wow. As you can tell, we're just getting started and we have three more. The Great Controversy in Paul's Letters, standing on the ancient battlefield, The Great Controversy in Paul's Letters again. But don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back. We're going to continue our lesson, The Great Controversy in Paul's Letters with Daniel Perrin. Thank you very much. And in keeping with the lesson title, I'm going to stick with Paul's letters except for one little detour into the book of Revelation and maybe somewhere else. Um, 
back in 1930, construction began on what at that time was the largest ship in the world. You may have heard of it, may have been there, uh, to the Queen Mary. No expense was spared. It was a luxury liner that at the time was 134 feet longer than the Titanic had been. Had five dining rooms and lounges, two cocktail bars, swimming pools, exercise rooms, even a small hospital. Uh, the only civilized way to travel at that time would have been on the Queen Mary for the rich and famous. That's where you wanted to be. And it was fast, 30 knots whatever that means. It turns out it's 34 miles per hour, which is still about what modern cruise ships travel. This was the ship to beat ships. Well, after three years of transporting the rich and famous, World War II broke out and the Queen Mary was repurposed. They painted it camouflage and nicknamed it the Grey Ghost. They blacked out the portholes. They, uh, they stripped it of its amen amenities. The luxury staterooms were traded for bunks, bunk beds, tablecloths, fine china replaced with a mess hall, pools replaced with military equipment. The first time ever that more than 10,000 people had been on a single boat at one time. And the message is this. You live differently when you're at war. That's right. You don't live the same way as when life is peaceful. When you're in a battle, you don't sit out there in a lawn chair, whistling with a drink in your hand, just watching the scenery go by. So are we living right now in a war? Are we living as if there is a war going on? Or are we li living as if the universe is at peace and as if the conflicts are settled and everyone who's been taken captive is already rescued and the enemy is not on our track moments behind us? Which way are we living? And that's what Paul is trying to impress upon us with the many military scenes and images that he does use throughout his epistles. And he writes that to people who were familiar with military being stationed in villages, in cities, and along roadways. And I'll share with you a couple of these texts here and then move into some ideas about the great controversy. Uh, Romans 13, verse 12 says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In him is light. We're putting on the armor of things that illuminate, that give us truth, that give us righteousness. First Thessalonians 5 verse 8. But let us who are, of, who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. You'll notice a little bit termin a different terminology than what Paul uses in Ephesians 6. And that reminds us that not every battle in the war is fought in exactly the same way. And God will fit his, his tools to us in the way that we need them. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 6, what a powerful text. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We're not using worldly weapons. This is all a spiritual conflict and it's happening not only out there, but in here. That's right. First Corinthians 15, 57, just a few more. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we're waging war, as we're waging peace, as we're fighting and in conflict, we know that it's already been victorious through Jesus. Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say if God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, there are two sides. And honestly, there are things, powers against us. But if God is for us, they fade into insignificant obscurity and already conquered. And Romans 8, 37, and all these things, we are more than conquerors. So Paul's got this going on in his letters. So what is the great controversy besides the title of a book that we should read if we haven't gotten to it yet? It's a big fight. People say, hey, have you, have you seen the big fight? And they're talking about some boxing match. They don't know anything. All right. <laughs> Paul knew about the great controversy because he had been on both sides. He stood there and held the coats as people stoned Stephen, a minister for God. And then in Acts 14, he was the one who, be, who religious people thought that the world would be better off without him. And they stoned him to, well, they thought they'd stoned him to death and threw him outside of the city. 
Paul knew what it was like on both sides. He understood Jesus' words in Matthew 10, 34, do not think I came to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. And that's what happens when the gospel is proclaimed. The conflict breaks out because our enemy does not want the gospel to be heard. It's a battle over the truth of who God is. The enemy has done his best to obscure what God is like, to make us attribute to God everything that is evil and wicked and destructive and painful and causing death throughout the universe and to run from him as Adam and Eve did in the garden when sin began. They began to hide from God. The issue of the great controversy is not God's opinion of us. It's our opinion of God. That's right. and, and that's what's trying, what God wants to have exalted through us to show what he is truly like through Jesus. The great controversy is universal. It's not a geographic war. It infects and it, it is involved in every home, every person, every streaming service, every cell phone. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you want to be godly, godlike, the enemy is going to attack you. You don't join the side of Christ and not incur the wrath of the enemy. A decision for Jesus is a de facto entry into a conflict. Mm, right. As Christians, we can't say, well, I don't want to be involved in a fight. We are. Mm, it's right. an all out war. And it's very individual. It's personal. The battle is not over things out there and it's safe over here, but everyone is involved. Listen to Romans 7, 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and its members. If I left the building today and someone grabbed me and was taking me away to captivity, I would fight. And if I walked out my front door in the morning, I saw a man fighting there on the front step. I wouldn't pull out a chair and pop some popcorn, although that's what most streaming services want us to do. I would, I would fight against whatever is going on here. There was a war going on. It involves each of us. And it's spiritual. Every moment of our life has significance. Mm -hmm. All right. God says in Proverbs 3, verse 6, trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Yes. Acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. And there are those who want to deny that the war is going on and live like they are at peace. But it's not true. Uh, the war is also physical. Wars, rumors of wars, sickness, distress, disease, pestilence, famine, bankruptcy, broken families, and violence. It's not just bad luck and geologic seismic activity and germ theory. Although there is, the physical battle pulled back reveals that there is a spiritual battle going on. All right. And so Paul says this, he says, uh, lest I should be exalted above measure, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, uh, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Paul realizes that the things he's going through physically are a part of a spiritual battle. And then he hears those words, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amen. And you will have a side to take. You play a part in this conflict. The godly life then is not so that God thinks well of us, but so that the world thinks well of God. And the right. devil is out against that. And here we go into Revelation 12, verse 17. Mm -hmm. The dragon is enraged with the woman and he goes to make war with those who are on God's side, who are keeping the commandments of God and that they have the testimony of Jesus. This is why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight. And what's the fight of? Faith. It's the fight of faith. And that's the putting the faith in Jesus Christ, the one who's already won the victory. We have a part in this. And I want to share just a paragraph from Great Controversy in a chapter, enmity, against, uh, enmity between man and Satan. Satan assailed Christ with his fiercest and most subtle temptations, but he was repulsed in every conflict. Those battles were fought in our behalf. Those victories make it possible for us to conquer. Christ will give strength to all who seek it. No man without his consent can be overcome by Satan. The tempter has no power to control the will or to force the soul to sin. He may distress, but he cannot contaminate. He can cause agony, but not defilement. 
The yes. fact that Christ has conquered should inspire his followers with courage to, I like these two words, fight manfully mm -hmm. the battle against sin and Satan. And you can find that phrase repeated a number of other times through Ellen White's writings. But the great controversy is what's already been victoriously won by Christ, but it's still finishing up in your life and in mine. And Paul sees that, he knew it, and uh, he encourages you. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, now we are on Wednesday, standing on the ancient battlefield. My name is John Dinsey, and we are moving now into a, an interesting aspect of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. The lesson calls us to note each time Paul uses some form of the verb stand, and why is this idea so important mm -hmm. to him? So in Ephesians chapter 6, we, uh, we begin there, and you will notice the, when you go through verses 10 to 20, that there are places where the word stand is used. One of them is uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we move to the next one, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Right. And here in verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we see here, these are the three times when the word stand is used. But I want to uh, encourage you to consider that we are on a war between good and evil. And you have to make a choice which side you're going to be on. And even when you choose to go on God's side, Satan is trying to pull you back mm -hmm. towards the evil side. But we have to participate and cooperate with God in order to stand. And so now I want to uh, uh, tell you that standing involves putting on the armor of God. This is an action, putting on the armor of God. And let's look at the different times when we see in these verses 6, uh, 10 to 20, uh, actions that you and I are supposed to do. Let's go ahead and go to, uh, to verse 13. Notice these action words. Actually, let's go to verse, uh, verse uh, 10 first. Uh, notice what we have to do. It says, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Ephesians 6, 10. And in verse 11, we are told to put on yes. the whole armor of God. And verse 12, we are told that we do not wrestle. There's a wrestling involved. We are involved in that wrestling. Mm -hmm. Verse 13, we are now told, therefore take up the whole armor of God mm -hmm. that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Right. And so when we go to verse 14, again, action for us, and that it says, stand there for having girded your waist with truth, mm -hmm. having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I like that, the gospel of peace. Mm -hmm. And so are you done? No, verse 16 says, above all, taking the shield of faith with you, uh, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Mm -hmm. And uh, this may be covered later on, but notice it says that the uh, wicked one has fiery darts. Mm -hmm. In a warfare, you know, you have the darts that have no fire on them and you have the darts that have fire on them. What's the purpose of the fiery darts? Uh, when the, uh, the, the, in war, when they used to put fire on an arrow or some dart, once the dart hits, then that, that person can burst the flames or whatever item was able to burst the flame. The devil's intention is that you will be, you will be uh, on fire and that you will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and move now to uh, verse 17. It says, and take mm -hmm. the helmet of salvation. Things that we are to do. This is, this is a, uh, a, a warfare <laughs> against self that we are to fight and we are not supposed to be idle. Some people have the idea, oh no, God is gonna do it all. Yes, I, I read a verse that says, the battle is the Lord, so I'm just gonna watch the Lord battle. No, we have to cooperate with the Lord. And so now we move to verse 18. Notice what it says here, another uh, instrument of warfare, and it says, praying. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. How often? It says pray always mm -hmm. with all prayer mm -hmm. and it says supplication in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Now again, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I remember a time that a gentleman called 3ABN and he presented this situation and he said, uh, I, am calling, uh, I am calling for prayer. And I, I said, well, okay, what is your first name? And I wrote down his request. Okay, we were going, we're going to pray with you. Maybe we can pray in a moment. Don't pray, don't pray, he said. Intercede, intercede. And there are times, my friend, when you have to realize that in the battle itself, you have to uh, persevere in prayer and ask the Lord to give you the victory. And it, it's a battle itself because with God, with Jesus, all things are possible. And as you have heard, without Jesus, we can do nothing, but with him, we can do all things. So I praise the Lord because we do not fight this battle alone. God is going to be with us. I'm reading to you from the lesson. Dr. McVay brought this out. It's very uh, interesting. It says, this is no relaxed stance. To stand then is to be vigorously engaged in battle, employing every weapon in close order combat. A point obvious from the military imagery in Paul's earlier exhortation to be found, standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. So now I take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to read verse 12 and 13. Notice what it says here. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. There in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, you hear, you, you read some of the uh, circumstances going on with the people of Israel, and it's a warning to us of the things that happened in the past. They were examples for us, but we are not to come to the point where we made it. I, I think I've made it. I'm fine now. I don't need the help of the Lord. I got this. You know, sometimes you, uh, I remember the, uh, Samuel and Caleb when they were little, our, our, our children, and uh, you try to help them with something you have helped them before, but somehow they've got it figured out. I can do it. I can do it myself. You know, I can do it myself. I can do this. And, but we as Christians, we need to understand that we are always dependent on the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ, dependent on the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. So let him who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. And we have good news for you. Just in case you did not know it, Verse 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And I praise the Lord for, for that. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able with his grace. Notice that it says he will not allow. That means he is in control. He is in control. Uh, every temptation that the devil wants to bring upon you has to be uh, sifted, has to be taken before the Lord. And the Lord says, yes, that's fine. That, that, that's all right. You can do that because uh, he's going to depend on, my, on me and he will be victorious if he takes hold of my strength. But sometimes the devil wants to do stuff to us that the Lord says, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So I praise the Lord that he is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted about what you are able. But with the temptation, it says, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So I praise the Lord that we are not left uh, at, the, at the will of the enemy. We have defense and Psalms 34 it says, the angel of the Lord mm -hmm. encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. Mm -hmm. We are not in this battle alone. God is with us. I'd like to read to you from Great Controversy, page 510. It says, while Satan is constantly seeking to blind their minds to the fact, let Christians never forget that they wrestle not against 
flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. Ephesians 6, 12. The inspired warning is sounding down the centuries to our time. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. But what are we to do? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yes, by the grace of the Lord, we can face every moment, every day of our lives with the armor of God and because of our faith and trust in Him, we will be able to stand. Amen. Amen. There is something that we have to do. And we are living in the reality of our spiritual war. Uh, so we need to be strong in the Lord because we cannot, but God can. That's what we've been learning as we've been going through the lesson today, the call to stand. I I uh, have Thursday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty. And the quarterly uh, directs us again to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, 10 through 12. 20. 20. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the question it asks for Thursday's lesson is, what do you judge to be Paul's purpose in listing a variety of titles for the evil spiritual powers depicted in Ephesians 1.21, Ephesians 3.20, and Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20? And so I wrote, wrote down a few things here that I picked up as I read through these verses. Ephesians 6.10, Paul wants to lead us to be strong in the Lord. That was one of the emphasis that we already have. Then in verse uh, 11, he wants to lead us to stand against these powers. As you were talking there, John, he wants to enlarge our minds. Ephesians 6 verse 12, he wants to enlarge our minds as to what we are up against. What are we facing? What are we up against? And then in Ephesians 1, 21 and 6, 13, he wants to, us to put on the whole armor of God. Uh, Ephesians 3 verse 10, he wants to make known to us the wisdom of God. And then Ephesians 6 19, he wants to make known to us the mystery of the gospel. And then Ephesians 6 verse 20, he wants us to speak boldly as we ought to speak. And we can only can do that in Christ. When I was uh, a young dad, I had a son uh, who was 12 months old and not walking. And my wife and I were a little bit worried about that. You know, our son's 12 months old, 13 months old, 14 months old. He's not walking. I finally, uh, I was talking to my dad and uh, he, we just kind of mentioned it to him. And he said, oh, he said, I didn't start walking until I was 19 months. And we were just kind of relieved. Okay, <laughs> this is something, maybe it's genetic. Our dad, you know, my dad didn't start walking until he was 19 months. And sure enough, our son started walking when he was 19 months old. You know, it's a phenomenon that is common to all of us. You know, we have these little babies and they crawl. Mm -hmm. And at some point they stand up. And of course we want them to walk. Uh, some parents don't want them to walk too soon. <laughs> We want them to walk, but before they can walk, they have to stand. In fact, walking is really standing in motion. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the theme that Paul is talking about here in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is really his masterpiece of the, the science of salvation. And, and in this book, Paul outlines a basic understanding of how salvation works. First of all, you stand in the gospel and then you walk in the spirit. You stand in the gospel and you walk in the spirit. Now, he emphasizes this in the first three chapters of Ephesians. Uh, three times we see this emphasis in the conclusion of the summary of Ephesians. John brought this out earlier, but let's just look at it again in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul's coming to his conclusion. And as he comes to this conclusion, he says, beginning here in verse 11... Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, day, in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then verse 14, stand therefore, stand, 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 stand. It's a summary of his emphasis. Now, when you look at this in the context of the rest of the book, it's really interesting because Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 3 don't really emphasize the walking part. But when you get into Ephesians chapter 4, the very first verse, let's just look there, going back to Ephesians 4 verse 1, the very first verse as he transitions, you know, he ends Ephesians 3 with this, Amen, 
which is really strange, you know, right in the middle of his epistle. Amen. Amen. Like it's all over. And then he, he, it's like he starts a whole new focus now. And his whole new focus starts with, I therefore, based on what I've just said in the three chapters before, the prisoner of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, beseech you that ye what? Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He's just given us the vocation. He's just explained to us what we've been called to. He's just outlined for us this beautiful predestined salvation that is given to us in a love of God that we need to measure its length, breadth, height, and depth, that we would be filled with the fullness of God. That's it. He's, he's handing that to us. He says, now, I want, you've just graduated. <laughs> I'm just giving you the diploma. Now I want you to walk. I want you to walk in this vocation. Where, and then he goes, on in, in, in verse 17 of chapter 4 and he says it again. Verse 14, this I say therefore, again, therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Verse uh, chapter 5 of Ephesians verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given us himself for an offering for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And then in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 5, For you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And again, he emphasizes this in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 5. Wherefore, he says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise. And that means stand up from the dead, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So you see, the only way my son was able to walk is if he first stood. If you're not standing, you're crawling. And crawling isn't walking. And God doesn't want us to crawl. God wants us to walk. But in order to walk, we have to stand. And the only way we can stand is if we understand the gospel. If we understand what God has predestined us to in Jesus Christ, what God has sealed us in through the gospel. If we only understand First, that we've been saved by grace through faith, and it's a gift of God, not of ourselves. If we only understand the fullness of God's love for us, once we get that, once we get up on our feet, then we'll be able to walk. So as we look at this, these last few verses in, in Ephesians, he's basically summarizing everything he's been sharing in the previous chapters, especially the verse 3. For example, the helmet of salvation is gifted to us by the grace of God, according to Ephesians chapter 2, 5, 3, 2, and 3. 3, 7. The shield of faith is gifted to us by Christ uh, according to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 3, 12. The breastplate of righteousness is gifted to us by Christ in Ephesians 2, 10 through, uh, 8 through 10. The sandals of peace are gifted to us to Christ in Ephesians 2, verse 14. He is our peace. The belt of truth is gifted to us by Christ in Ephesians 1, verse 13. The, the written word of God is gifted to us to Christ in Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. The unceasing prayer is gifted to us by Christ who continually calls us to unceasing prayer in Ephesians 1 and verse 16. So what we see here is that God wants us to walk worthy, not as the Gentiles in love, as children of light, more perfectly, not as fools, but as wise as we stand in everything Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Why? Because our walking indicates that we have taken a hold of the vocation that God has called us to. Our walking, our fruit, proves that we are indeed standing in Jesus Christ. So... When we look at this picture, this beautiful picture that we have in the book of Ephesians, this, this picture of the salvation that comes to us in Jesus Christ and what it produces in the life, it produces this vocation that is seen in the church, in the world, in the family, and even in the workplace, even in the most difficult situations. You know, Paul brings out the illustration of slavery. You know, the, the worst situation that we could be in probably as a human being is to be owned by someone else and, and in, a, in a situation of bondage. And God's saying to us through the, the epistle of, of uh, Ephesians here, God is saying to us, you can walk worthy of the vocation that I've called you to even in the most difficult situations. And there were many people in Paul's day who were slaves in Rome under Nero, one of the worst tyrant leaders that ever lived. And these people were walking worthy of the vocation that God had called them to. They were walking as witnesses for Jesus Christ. And so the epistle to the Ephesians is powerful because it has this uh, uh, amazing outline, amazing 
uh, principle of the science of salvation that stand in the gospel and walk in the spirit. Stand in the fruit of the gospel and walk in the spirit of the gospel and in the fruit uh, or the fruits of those spirit. We, we use the word fruit because, as singular, but it's actually identifying something that's plural. You know, if I go to the store and get fruit and I bring it home, I could have bananas and oranges and apples and, and pineapples. That's all fruit. And when we look at the fruit of the spirit, God says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. All of this fruit is to be manifest, as was mentioned earlier, in the different situations and circumstances that we're in. God is calling us to bear witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the, the more, the better, the, the, the purer the fruit, the more testimony we give to the purity and the power of the gospel in our lives. So stand in the gospel and walk in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Wow. We've been called to stand. Jill, what's your closing thought for your lesson today? Are you in a battle? Do you feel like you're struggling in that battle and you're looking to yourself or to other people or to any manner of thing? Look to Jesus. You can find strength in Christ for any battle that you face. Hmm. The great controversy is still raging, even in insignificant, seemingly insignificant places like the highway right behind that slow car. And our victorious God comes and says, let me conquer that driver for you. Mm. Not the slow one in front, but the impatient one behind. <laughs> Praise <laughs> the Lord. Uh, I'd like to share with you this final thought. It is from Steps to Christ, page 43. The war self, the war fair against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. I encourage you, submit yourself completely to God. God is calling us to stand and then walk. So my encouragement to you is we need to stand fast. We need to stand fast in the gospel of Jesus Christ so we can walk in the spirit. Hey, man, Amen. wonderful illustration. Thank you so much for joining us, friends. You know, there's a question that John poses in the book of Revelation, Revelation 6 and verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? When you stand during the time of the battle, you can stand in the day of wrath. And then finally, Revelation 15, verse 2, those who had gotten the victory of the beast will be standing on the sea of glass. Stand now, stand in the day of wrath, and you'll stand in the day of ultimate victory. Well, thank you for joining us. We've talked about the call to stand. Next lesson is waging peace. How ironic is that? How do you wage peace? Well, join us next time for lesson number 13. And you'll find out how you can wage peace in the person of Jesus Christ. We look forward to seeing you then.